Welcome, everyone. And thank you all for joining us at the uh, PIH Office of Field Operations Special Purpose Conference. We are going to get started in just a minute. We'll let folks in the waiting room join in. Um, and uh, to start us off, uh, we will have opening remarks from Dr. Felicia Gaither, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Office of Field Operations, followed by Richard Minocchio, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Office of Public and Indian Housing. We'll give folks just a few more minutes to make sure everybody is able to connect to audio. We can go to the next slide. So um, just for folks that joined um, just a minute ago, you might not have heard me. Um, to start us off uh, for the conference today, we will be joined by Dr. Felicia Gaither, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Office of Field Operations, followed by Richard Minocchio, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Public and Indian Housing. Dr. Gaither, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning, everyone. For some of you, it's pretty early, especially if you are on the West Coast. So thank you for starting your morning with us. Uh, but welcome to our special purpose voucher conference hosted by um, Housing and Urban Development, Public and Indian Housing, Office of Build Operations. Um, we are excited about the next couple of days and uh, the time that we will spend sharing information with you all to improve, increase, enhance your voucher programs, and especially those focused on our special populations, our most vulnerable populations. Uh, and so that is why we are having the Special Purpose Voucher Conference. Uh, so I get the honor of introducing our Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Mr. Richard Monacchio. Uh, Pete S. Monacchio has been with Public and Indian Housing a little over a year, and in this year, he has made his mark across the country, visiting many PHAs, uh, housing authorities, re talking to residents, being in communities in order to, to demonstrate how committed we are here at HUD to support our housing authority partners, to ensure that our residents have access to safe and decent housing. And so without further ado, I turn it over to my PDAS, Richard Minocchio. PDAS Minocchio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Felicia. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank my friends at uh, Enterprise as well. Um, had the pleasure of working with Andrea in Chicago. Um, I hope the background noise isn't bad. I made, I think I made the mistake of coming down to the hotel lobby to have a little more air, but- uh, We can hear you great, thank you. Good. So, you know, I was just telling Felicia um, what a great agenda this is. I, I um, really am pleased to see this happen. Like Felicia said, I, I've had the great pleasure of getting around the country and back again a few times. The, the most the most rewarding part of course is seeing the work we do together and you know at the same time visiting the field offices i i know i see so many familiar names on this um call and i've had the great pleasure of working directly with many of you and or meeting with you and your staffs and i have to say that um i've been i've come away extremely impressed the dedication that you all show is uh, inspiring to me. And we do it in a environment that's not easy. Um, I'm very, you know, I'm very, I, I, some of the common themes I get are, you know, Rich, we really want to hold these housing authorities more accountable, but, you know, either they don't listen or we can't. And, and so that, that resonates with me. And, I've told uh, Felicia and I've told the, the directors that, you know, we need, you be as aggressive as you need to be. The, the majority of the PHAs of course are well run, but the ones that aren't are, are ones that we really have to stay on and try to get to as early as we can. I was just at a couple this week in, in Michigan, um, but I know it's not easy and I, really you all are looking out for the 
the residents and the taxpayers. The, the thing I've mentioned when I'm out is, you know, two things that I don't tolerate. Bad buildings and money being wasted. And, you know, you, what you do is <laughs> you're on the front lines of this. And I'm very pleased to see that we are, are getting out more um, in this post-COVID environment. I know it's been a little challenging. Um, we've tried, we've, we've had to traverse some of these transportation issues, um, but I hope that's getting worked out in terms of the cars and, you know, maybe driving your personal car or renting a car. I really want to make it as easy as possible because we, we need to be out. And I know you agree because I've, I, I've talked to you all about it. So the second thing I want to say is, you know, the, the, the work you have done to increase voucher utilization and occupancy is impressive. Um, you know, I know that for a few years there, um, nationwide, the numbers were, were a little down. And, you know, under Felicia's leadership and Dominique's leadership, you all made it a top priority to say that, you know, we know we don't have enough resources to begin with, but the resources we do have, we have to use. And I've seen these numbers go up and it's not easy when, you know, when you're at a level of 88 or 92% to push that number up. It isn't easy. And um, I just want you to know that I'm appreciative of that. This, um, this conference, I think, is, uh, I've seen some good ones. We've had some great ones uh, in, in D.C. and in the all over the country. This one is really special, I think, because this really gets to uh, how we manage the voucher program for some of our most vulnerable participants and how, how housing authorities and HUD really need to think more innovatively and strategically about how these vouchers get used. Because when you're talking about VASH, when you're talking about FYI, when you're talking about mainstream and near elderly, you're really talking about partnerships too, right? We need the VA, we need the child welfare agencies, and uh, we need the COCs. So this is, you know, we've, we've uh, grown in that way in terms of making these connections. You know, personally, I, I've uh, been very pleased. I know we've had a couple already. Um, the FYI convenings. I'll be getting to some later in the summer, but that's a good example of what we're doing, right? We're getting other parts of HUD involved and we are working with HHS to really expand the reach in the effectiveness of the federal government. Uh, VASH, you know, VASH is, VASH is hard in some parts of the country because our friends at the VA who we're working with, you know, sometimes we don't get enough um, referrals and that bothers me. So we're going to, we're going to pick up the pace on that because, um, you know, we just announced yesterday that there's more uh, VASH vouchers available and we just have to make sure every one of those gets utilized. So I'm very um, happy again, that this we're focusing on this specific issue of, special purpose vouchers because it does strike at the heart of who we are and what we do. And uh, Felicia, again, uh, I want to thank you for your leadership and your partnership. You know, I get involved in a lot of things, as some of you know, um, maybe sometimes a little more than I should, but I'm one of those guys when I see a problem, I try to fix it. And, uh, you know, your work with me has been um, outstanding. And, you know, these, these next five months, of course, um, as we as we close out this particular term, are going to be very busy. We have a lot going on in the field in terms of uh, initiatives and also some housing authorities that need some extra help. So you will be seeing a lot more of me. And if you haven't seen me yet, 
I hope to see you all soon. And again, have a great conference. And Felicia, thanks for putting this on. Thank you, Pete Asmanafigo. Safe travels to you. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So, so again, thank you to Pete Asmanakio for his comments. Um, and, and I just, before I turn it over to our uh, producers and, and uh, we begin our conference, I'd like to just, you know, circle back on a couple of things that the Pete Asmanakio said. One, he said, our partners are very important. You will hear over the next two days in this virtual conference, the commitment of our partners to be in this together with us as we try to ensure that the vouchers get into the hands of the folks that need them the most. Um, and so also collaboration. We cannot do this without collaborating with partners. Every one of these programs requires a referral. In order to get those referrals, we have to have connections with the right folks, have the right people at the meetings, have the right um, individuals on your on your call list in order for us to be able to make those vouchers accessible. So I leave you with these three th three words that I'll be thinking about throughout the conference uh, that I hope you'll be thinking about and that you'll be able to walk away with something to use. And one is about connection. How can I connect more? Is there some other group that we can think about partnering with? Uh, collaboration. We've got to have a heart for collaboration to do this work. And I know you all do. That's why you're up on this call this morning. Uh, and commitment. Continuing to be committed to the people that need us the most. Those, those youth that need us the most. The veterans that need us the most. Those individuals that are, are experiencing homelessness. And so as I listen to the speakers, and I know the team has done a phenomenal job in getting you the right folks to present to you today uh, and tomorrow. And so um, I'll be thinking about how I can help, how I can support connections, collaboration, and again, continue to be committed to this work. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea to lead us through the agenda and to, to move us along. So enjoy the next two days. I'll be popping in throughout, uh, but but please, please be open and listening and, and stay engaged. This is a virtual conference, so I know it gets a little hard. We can get distracted, but please stay engaged and give us your thoughts on how we continue to support you. So thank you all. Enjoy the time. Andrea. Thank you, Dr. Gaither. Um, and thank you, Pete Asmanakio. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Andrea Jurisnak, Director of Fair Housing and Public Housing Revisioning Team with Enterprise Community Partners Advisors. Enterprise is a HUD technical assistance and consulting contractor, and we've been working hard with the HUD Office of Field Operations team and others to create an engaging and informative conference for you all. Before we move into our first panel, just a few housekeeping items. We recommend viewing the conference in side-by-side -side speaker view so to change your Zoom view, go to the upper right hand corner of the Zoom screen and you will see where there's a drop down uh, for view and you just click on side by side speaker. That way you'll be able to see all the speakers as they are spotlit um, along with the slides. Um, this conference is being recorded. All slides, recordings, transcripts and additional materials will be made available to attendees in the coming weeks after the conference. You will receive an email from us when those materials have been posted to the HUD exchange. All attendees are in listen only mode, but the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom screen is available for questions to panelists. We will be collecting all questions posted in the chat, so if your question is unable to be answered live, we will be sending answers to all attendees with the conference recording and other materials. In addition, you can also email questions to spvconference at enterprisecommunity.org. We can go ahead and put that email address into the chat to everyone uh, if you have any questions during or after the conference. Each panel has its own opportunities for audience participation, including polls that we will be launching throughout the conference. If you're not familiar with Zoom polls, they will pop up directly on your screen and you'll be able to type and click or click your responses. Don't hesitate to ask in the chat if you have any questions or issues when polls are launched. Finally, we are bringing this conference to you in a virtual environment with speakers and presenters from all across the nation. We thank you in advance for your grace and patience uh, should anyone experience technical issues. I'm now going to turn it over to Julie Miles, who will be moderating our first panel. 
Julie is the Regional Public Housing Director for HUD's Mountain and Plains Network, which includes PHAs in Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, and Missouri. Julie's got quite a job. So Julie, take it away. All right, thank you. Next slide, please. Good morning and uh, um, welcome again is the first session of our SPB conference. I'm, I'm very excited for the sessions that we have over the next two days. Okay, so today's, this morning's session, our first session to kick off our SPB conference, opening doors to opportunity, solutions for mainstream and non-elderly disabled voucher success. After a very inspiring opening from PDAS Monocchio and DAS Dr. Gaither, um, I hope that we'll all be able to come together and, and share ideas on ways that we can increase our utilization of these two very important special purpose vouchers. So today we're gonna have two speakers. We could go to the next slide and they'll present some background information and some other information about mainstream and NED. And then we're gonna open it up for a panel. So you'll also hear from three of your peers. We have Emily Warren, the Senior Housing Program Specialist with HUD's Office of Public Housing Voucher Programs. Lisa Sloan, the Director at the Technical Assistance Collaborative. And then your peers, Andrea McDougall, Executive Director of the Mansfield Housing Authority, Armika Crawford, Chief Executive Officer of Peoria Housing Authority, and Dee Pouliot, Managing Director of the Assisted Housing Division at New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. So thank you to our PHA participants uh, on this panel. Their, their knowledge and experience is very valuable, and I'm looking forward to this being a very collaborative session. So now that you know who's going to be speaking during the session, we want to hear from you to see what size housing authority uh, you have for your programs, the mainstream and the non-elderly disabled vouchers. So we're going to do our first poll. So if broadcast could start the poll. And this poll is how many vouchers, mainstream and Ned, just combine them, does your PHA administer? So if you could click the one that, that is applicable, we'll give this about a minute and we'll see what our results are. So we can see who are who is in our audience, what size programs you have. have Jeopardy music or something because we're waiting for these answers. We should be getting close. We'll wait for broadcast to show us the results. Here we go. Okay, so, oh, it just went off my screen. There it is again. Okay, so our results. It looks like a few of you, less than 25, 25 to 50, um, nearly a quarter, 50 to 100. So it looks like more than half are more than 100 uh, combined mainstream and NED. All right, well, thank you. Okay, so now we know kind of what our audience is and you've heard from me about who is going to be on our panel. So we'll turn it over to our first speaker. If we could go to the next slide, please. Emily Warren with the Office of Public Housing and Voucher Programs. We do Thanks. the next slide. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Julie. Uh, hi, I'm Emily Warren. I'm in uh, the Housing Voucher Management and Operations Division, which is the Voucher Policy Office. And I work on a couple of our special purpose voucher programs, including Mainstream and NED. And I'm going to just provide a little bit of Mainstream NED 101. Um, and then I will mention a few recent funding opportunities uh, for Mainstream and talk a little bit about what utilization is looking like. 
And I will briefly talk about partnerships and how they can be valuable for mainstream to sort of tee up, I think, part of our panel discussion and part of what uh, Lisa Sloan from TAC will be covering. And then I'll also just briefly mention some forth forthcoming flexibilities. So first, um, I imagine this is something that a lot of you already know, but maybe it's something, I think maybe when the public thinks about housing choice vouchers, we think about uh, it serving mostly families with children, but um, uh, about a quarter of the 2.4 million households that are served through the voucher program are non-elderly uh, families with a disability or someone in the family has a disability. Um, so, and they're served through mainstream, through NED, through other SPVs, and of course, through the regular voucher program. And there are a really um, large uh, proportion of the uh, households that we serve. Uh, next slide, please. So just a few mainstream basics. The first mainstream vouchers were awarded back in 1997, and the Frank Melville Act of 2010 converted mainstream to be part of Section 8.0 of the uh, U.S. Housing Act of 1937, uh, although funding and financial reporting for mainstream vouchers remain separate. To be eligible for a mainstream voucher, uh, the family must have a person who is uh, has a disability and also is 18 years of age or older and less than 62 years of age. And so other than that eligibility requirement that I just mentioned for defining non-eligibly disabled, uh, mainstream vouchers follow the same program policies as the regular tenant-based voucher program. Next slide. A few NED basics now. Uh, so most NED vouchers resulted from conversions of properties from serving persons with disabilities to only elderly. And the last awards were made back in 2011. And there are two NED categories. Category one is vouchers that serve non-elderly persons with disabilities. And category two is vouchers that specifically serve those that are transitioning from institutional settings. Next slide. So this table just highlights a few um, differences and similarities for mainstream and NED. They both serve non-elderly persons with disabilities. They both follow the policies of the regular housing choice voucher program. For NED, the eligible household member must be the head of household, but that's not the case for mainstream. Um, mainstream has separate financial reporting while NED does not. Uh, for both programs, vouchers reissued vouchers reissued upon turnover to the next eligible family. In terms of size of the program, there's a little over 71,000 mainstream vouchers and almost 55,000 NED vouchers. And both, I believe, are, are the two highest uh, utilization, have the highest utilization among the SPVs nationally. So kudos to the PHAs on this call for that, um, especially for bumping mainstream utilization up above 80%. Um, I believe uh, beginning in February. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just to show how much the program has um, expanded over time, how much mainstream vouchers have expanded over time. So back in 2015, uh, there were only about almost 15,000 vouchers. And then in 2018, um, for reasons unclear to me, but it was um, a great development, the uh, in fiscal year 2018, mainstream vouchers uh, received, I believe, almost $550 million in funding compared to $150 million the previous year. So there was a, there were a, was a NOFO in 2018 and 2019 where um, about 12,000 and then 15,000 vouchers were awarded respectively. And then through the CARES Act, HUD was provided authority to non-competitively award mainstream vouchers. Uh, and using um, and these vouchers were funded using carryover funds. So almost 25,000 vouchers were awarded in 2020. And then we used the CARES Act authority again in 2022 to award an additional 4,600 vouchers plus about 30 million in extraordinary admin fees. So that you can see that kind of explains some of the utilization dips over time and we're just kind of slowly going back up. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I believe we have a poll here about partnerships. 
So we'll give everyone a minute. Sing Jeopardy in your head or out loud if you're on mute. Okay, I'm not good at telling time, but I think that's been about a minute. So maybe we can bring up the results. Okay, so the question was, does your PHA rely on partner agencies for any of the following? So this is great. So it looks like we have a lot of PHAs with partnerships for um, the application process, documenting homeless status, case management, and securing a unit, housing search assistance. That's great. Um, so then sounds like so many of you are already doing uh, some of these things I'm about to talk about, which is wonderful. Um, let's see. So uh, I'm just, so I will, I know that Lisa, I think Lisa is going to go over some of these in more detail. Um, so I will just briefly touch on them in terms of the benefits of partnerships for PHAs when it comes to mainstream vouchers to help improve utilization. Uh, so the first one is we know that families, especially maybe if a person has certain types of disabilities, might especially struggle with the application process, collecting documentation, et cetera. So um, having families uh, who have access to a case manager to help with that um, process can be really beneficial. Second, uh, especially if the PHA has, uh, let's say, a NOFO uh, preference for people experiencing homelessness, uh, using something like um, a partnership through coordinated entry uh, eliminates the need for PHAs to independently verify homeless status. Uh, securing a unit. So we know that mainstream voucher participants can really struggle sometimes for a lot of different reasons with securing a unit. Maybe they have certain accessibility needs, um, uh, landlord discrimination, et cetera. And so uh, partners who can help with that, uh, that can be really beneficial uh, and improve success rates. Uh, financial resources, we know uh, from emergency housing vouchers, um, especially that those services fees were helpful so that um, PHAs could cover things like uh, uh, security deposits and utility deposits. So um, obviously if you if a, you have a partner who has resources that can cover those kinds of um, uh, needs, that can be uh, really helpful. And then finally, um, you know, so SP, so mainstream is different from some of the other SPVs in that there's no um, built in ongoing case management. So if you have, if you can identify a partner who can provide whatever supportive services are needed to address any issues that might threaten the family's tenancy and assistance, uh, then that can be really helpful as well. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Uh, so I'm just going to highlight uh, this language was included in the fiscal year uh, 24 Consolidated Appropriations Act. And essentially it provides HUD with authority to waive certain statutory and regulatory provisions. Um, it, so see the highlighted section, provisions related to the administration of waiting lists, local preferences, and the initial term and extensions of tenant-based vouchers. So there will be a forthcoming notice uh, for mainstream um, that describes how HUD is going to be um, using exercising this authority. So stay tuned. Um, and next slide, please. Here's my contact information. I really do check this inbox. It's not a black hole, I promise. So feel free to reach out with any mainstream policy questions and I will pass it over to, uh, I'll pass it back to Julie. Uh, thank you, Emily. We have a few questions in the chat that perhaps you could answer. Um, the first question is, why does homeless homelessness need to be documented? Uh, so 
homelessness would need to be documented um, since, because that's, uh, so if you, for example, had um, like a, a preference for people experiencing homelessness in mainstream, uh, for mainstream vouchers, um, you would need to be documenting homeless status as just part of, that's just something that you need to keep in the tenant file for potential reviews um, so that you've documented that that person was in fact experiencing homelessness. Okay, and another question. Do all PHAs have access or knowledge of the use of the COC supportive funds for securing units? That's a really great, great question. Um, I think that's something uh, if you have a relationship with your COC to ask them about, um, because I, my sense is that sometimes that's an underused resource from the PHA perspective. Um, so, I would I would definitely recommend reaching out to your to your continuum of care um, and asking about that and how you can leverage those resources for your applicants that are being referred by the COC. Okay, and another question is, what is the timing for the new notice? Um, so the timing should be summer 2024. Okay, the next one is administrative, getting access to the slides and the recording. Okay, Andrea's already answered that. Okay, this is something that I think has is, is come up um, in my network also, this kind of confusion over whether is homelessness a requirement for mainstream? No, but um, if you were awarded um, vouchers through either the 2018 or 2019 NOFOs, um, there, you might have received preference points if you would have received preference uh, uh, points in the NOFO uh, competition if you had agreed to adopt a preference for uh, one of, I think, four or five different subgroups. They vary by NOFO. Um, and one of them was for family, for uh, applicants experiencing homelessness. So you are required to um, continue uh, with that preference if, if that's one that you um, uh, agreed to adopt as part of the NOFO. So that would be a reason why. Okay, that really explains it because that is, like I said, that's come up in my network. So so you, just to reiterate what you said, if they received the, the vouchers from 2018 or 2019 because they had a preference, they must continue to have that preference. Correct. Okay, gotcha. Okay, next question. Will the notice announce new available mainstream vouchers? No, um, HUD did not receive any new any funding for new mainstream vouchers in fiscal year 24. So okay. this will just be a policy notice. Okay. And for participants, feel free to ask questions in the chat throughout the conference. You'll see if you kind of hover down towards the bottom of your screen, the menu will pop up and you'll see the the chat feature so you can open that up and ask questions and we'll continue checking those. Okay, I don't see any additional questions. So thank you, Emily. Um, and we will move on to our next presenter. So if we could go to the next slide. So our next speaker is Lisa Sloan and she is going to be uh, discussing the need for mainstream and, and NED vouchers and lessons learned from communities of practice. So Lisa, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, good morning. Uh, looks like my camera doesn't like me. Uh, so if I plug it in again. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'll start talking to the camera thing. There it is. Hi, how are you all? Um, my name's Lisa Sloan, and I'm a director in the housing practice at the Technical Assistance Collaborative. We're a nonprofit based in Boston, uh, and we work specifically in the space of supporting people with disabilities and people experiencing 
and at risk of homelessness to move into and stay successfully in the community. And we've had the, um, the pleasure of being able to uh, work uh, in this space for a long time and including doing some technical assistance on behalf of HUD uh, around the mainstream program. So I'm gonna be talking about two things. Uh, one is uh, something that probably you all know, uh, you have lots of, you know, 60% of you, I think, have more than 100 mainstream vouchers. So you know how important these are. I'm going to just touch on, uh, kind of remind everybody how important these are to the disability community. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the community of practices that we've been holding. Emily uh, just alluded to those on behalf of HUD. Um, uh, and uh, in order to support utilization, and uh, I don't think we can take any credit for that 80%, but I'd like to think that all together, uh, all the work that you all and HUD and uh, TA providers are doing is helping. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so uh, mainstream and NED vouchers are, are really, really important to people with disabilities. These vouchers, um, they address some critical issues that I'm gonna talk about in a second. One is uh, the fact that uh, many people with disabilities have extremely low incomes. Uh, many people with disabilities continue to be institutionalized despite sort of laws uh, promoting integration uh, because of uh, their income and the lack of uh, opportunity for um, housing. And um, and as a consequence, also many people with disabilities are homeless. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, HUD and the um, folks who organized this asked me to talk a little bit about <clears throat> this work we do. Um, we've been doing for about uh, more than 20 years um, with a group of about 100 uh, national disability organizations based in DC called the Consortium for constituents with disabilities, say that 10 times fast. Um, and this is uh, priced out. Uh, it used to be a, an actual publication that we um, we sent around, um, but uh, during COVID it became an online uh, service, which is um, means that we can keep the data up to date. Uh, we update it three times a year, um, which I think uh, if you do advocacy work in this area, hopefully it's helpful. So uh, we look, the point of Priced Out is exactly that, that uh, there's no market anywhere in the country, and this has been true for a very long time, that someone whose sole source of income is so supplemental social security or SSI can afford a one bedroom apartment. In um, uh, nationally, I think these, the statistic is from uh, January 1st, uh, there are uh, more than 4 million people uh, between the ages of 18 and 64. So very close to the NED, which is 62 and under. Um, but in that group, 4 million people whose sole source of income is Social Security income. And on average, nationally, that's $985 per month that those folks uh, receive. Um, that's on average. Some states have a uh, state supplement which means that they they add to that and there may be a, more income. But even in that case, it's really hard to imagine that they can afford the rent. The average rent for basic one bedroom apartment uh, nationally is almost $1,400. And that's 142% of what somebody who earns, uh, who gets $985 a month gets. So it's not affordable. Not only can you, nobody's gonna rent that apartment to you. Doesn't work. Next slide, please. Just to illustrate uh, the sort of just how how low income these four million people are, um, this this little graphic shows you the the line in the the horizontal line in the middle is the median income. That means half the people in the United States would be above that line in terms of their income and half below. It's just a line that's always drawn. You use this data all the time in your eligibility determinations. Uh, as you may be aware, most of the affordable housing production these days is um, comes through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, along with some of the other programs, including ones that you may administer. And those units are usually affordable to people at 60 and 50% of 
area median income. And you can see the horizontal lines there for 60 and 50. In your um, straight housing choice voucher program, most of the folks that you serve, uh, at least when they entered the program, had 30% uh, their incomes were ELI, extremely low income, or 30% of median income. People on SSI, that 985 a month, their benefits, they're at about 20% of median income on average across the country. So they're 10% lower than um, even the other folks that you serve. So these are folks who really do not have other options. Next slide, please. So what's the consequence of this? The consequence is that, um, first of all, uh, that 84% of uh, people with disabilities who have low income, so if you include ELI and a little higher, they're eligible for housing assistance still, but they don't receive it. That's 15 million households, a lot of people. 31% um, of ho all homeless individuals um, who um, are people who experience chronic homelessness. And that means that the definition of chronic homelessness means that they have a disabling condition. And 65% of those are living in unsheltered locations. 30% of homeless veterans um, experience chronic patterns of homelessness. So they too have a disabling condition. So there's lots of folks who just fall out um, into homelessness as a result of the income and lack of housing. Next slide, please. The other consequence is institutionalization. Uh, so many folks kind of cycle through this pattern, but right now there are about 900,000 people with disabilities under the age of 64 who live in institutional settings, such as psychiatric hospitals and nursing facilities. So not only is this, um, for many people, an unwarrant, unwarranted restriction. They would live in the community if they could find the, the right combination of affordable housing or a voucher or both and, um, you know, and the supports they might need. But being in the institution is not only most people's preference, but it's also a health risk. As many of you may remember, uh, during the pandemic, um, almost a quarter of the deaths were in nursing facilities. Um, people, um, older people, younger people, very much at risk. And similar statistics for people with disabilities who are in congregate care settings, such as intermediate care facilities for people with intellectual or de developmental disabilities, group homes, and behavioral treatment centers. So very, very much at risk. Next slide. So these vouchers really matter. Uh, trying to get to 100% utilization really matters. Every voucher that you are able to connect with someone um, who is extremely low income, who has SSI, um, is going to prevent them from hopefully being institutionalized, being homeless, or to solve one of those problems. Next slide, please. So uh, as Emily uh, said, utilization really has gone up. 80% was a you know, great number, uh, but that still means there are a lot of vouchers that are underutilized and that there are challenges in um, in achieving, you know, the numbers that we used to have 90, 95%. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, so uh, starting in 21, HUD asked and tasked um, TAC to do some community of practices with public housing agencies to try to both understand the challenges uh, related to utilization and to identify where, you know, successful strategies so that those could be shared. Um, and we, community of practice is essentially a voluntary opportunity for um, agencies to come together. Uh, we did facilitated discussion. We provided some information, but really we just tried to have agencies share their experience and uh, do some peer-to-peer -peer work. Um, we did four, uh, one with state public housing agencies, one with agencies in Minnesota, a third with agencies in Connecticut, and the most recent one with PHAs in New Jersey. Altogether, we had 48 public housing agencies um, participate. Next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna highlight the probably what is no surprise to any of you, the challenges that we identified through the COPs. 
Um, one was around waiting list management, um, especially in the beginning when these vouchers uh, first started being, uh, you know, they, as Emily described, they were first issued in the late 90s and then for, I don't know, maybe almost 10 years. And then there were none. And then it's, the, Congress provided additional vouchers in 18. And at that point, especially um, housing agencies weren't, you know, it wasn't a routine thing to get new vouchers and certainly not to get these targeted vouchers. And um, uh, housing authorities hadn't necessarily asked people in their in their sort of maybe preliminary application if they had a dis you know disability or disabling condition. Um, so um, housing agencies, be because um, mainstream vouchers are treated, um, the rules essentially apply to the same rules that apply to your housing choice vouchers apply to mainstream, except for this targeting. Um, they, you have to serve people through your single waiting list system. And that there were challenges in the beginning, especially, but even now um, some agencies are finding challenge, that challenging. Um, as I said, maybe you couldn't find people on your waiting list. Your waiting list had been closed. Your waiting list was very long. How are you going to open it up to do the preference that Emily just talked about that maybe you put in your application so that you would come more successfully for so an institutionalization preference or a homeless preference so the single waiting list was um, a challenge and made it hard to get started for many housing agencies uh, case management supports um, I saw in the um, uh, in the poll that was done 62 percent of you have agencies that do case management support that's awesome what we found um, in our COPs is that um, applicants, eligible applicants who did had case management supports were able to get through the process. Even if you had really simplified it, they were able to complete the application, um, uh, get their documentation in a timely manner, conduct a housing search and find a unit, and then uh, sign a lease and move in. If they had either professional case management supports or uh, a family member who was really, you know, going through this whole process with them. Uh, those people who did not have um, supports, even, um, even when you all, housing agencies had kind of simplified the process, they fell out all along the way. It's just, they were not able to, to do this on their own. Maybe they didn't have transportation to look for a unit. Maybe they couldn't go through the process of finding their documentation but they, it was very hard for them to complete the process, which then meant, you know, you know, depending on how many um, vouchers you issued, that impacts your utilization, right? So it's not good for the numbers, it's not good for the individuals, so that is a complication. And the last issue was, um, uh, and this has only increased, you know, unfortunately, is uh, landlord engagement and unit identification that, um, uh, that even um, that even the traditional program, uh, as you were issuing vouchers, people were having a hard time finding units, and this would be especially hard for some folks, especially folks looking for specialized units like accessible units, which some of it, some of you, especially if you targeted um, people coming from institutions, probably saw folks who had access needs. Next slide, please. Lisa, we do have a um, a poll on that last slide, so I don't okay. know if you want to launch that now. Yeah, please. Okay. Ashley, go ahead. How would so you this rank... is... mm -hmm. yep. Go ahead. How would you rank the following challenges um, identified in the community practice? Uh, first being most challenging and third being the least challenging. Uh, waiting list management, the single site, the single waiting list, um, case management supports, landlord engagement, unit identification.
How's it look? Are we ready to look at it? Yeah, so it looks like folks have identified, let's see, landlord engagement and unit identification as their top most challenging um, case management supports is the second most challenging and then waiting list management as the third most challenging. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, there we go. So, um, uh, so the, so in addition to identifying the challenges, the, through the community practice, we really, uh, tried to learn what, what had worked in communities and, uh, uh, in especially this last COP we did, uh, there were a lot of ho housing authorities participating who had decent utilization numbers and really were willing to share. Uh, they wanted to improve even better, but they had had some success and wanted to share. So, um, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, waiting list preferences, um, again, uh, partnerships and landlord incentives. Next slide, please as just some of the strategies that were identified. Thank you. So one of the strategies, um, uh, not many of you are still having issues with waiting lists, but, um, but one of the strategies is really to use preferences as a, a way to manage um, the fact that you have a big waiting list and here you have uh, you know, not uh, not insignificant, but you know, smaller number of vouchers coming for a targeted population, and um, one way to do that is with preferences. And uh, just to remind everybody, there are allowable and not allowable preferences under the Housing Choice Voucher Program specifically. Um, examples of allowable preferences are uh, experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Uh, people exiting institutions or at risk of institutionalization or targeting people with disabilities generally. What you cannot do in the tenant-based housing choice voucher program is have a disability specific preference, like a preference for people with psychiatric disabilities or a preference for people with physical disabilities. That is not allowed. Um, disability is a covered class under the Fair Housing Act, and so it would be considered a violation the way the program is set up. There are some programs out there where you are allowed to target disabilities. If you guys work with the 811 program, for example, the statute allows targeting, uh, but that's not the case with the Housing Choice Voucher Program for tenant-based. However, for project-based, the, um, the statute uh, has changed to allow uh, specific services, which is essentially a way to target by disabilities. The other thing that's important to know is, in addition to the allowable preferences, which, as Emily pointed out, if you uh, at, got points in 18 or 19 uh, round, then you you had to put one of these preferences in place because you may have um, raised your hand and said you would do that. Um, but you can cap the preference. So, for example, uh, if you received 50 in the 18 round, you received 50 vouchers and you indicated you would target people who are homeless, then you can do a capped preference for 50 vouchers uh, for people who are, who are homeless. And you can, you can structure that in your tenant selection plan that way. Um, uh, and that means once you serve 50 people, those you, you always have to have 50 people who have been experiencing previously homelessness but um, so, but you don't have to do more than 50. So let's say you do 50 to turn over, then you would look for people on your waiting list who meet that preference. Um, and uh, you can keep, um, you, you can close your waiting list in general, but keep it open for a capped preference, for example, which would allow you to do some outreach if you don't have anybody on your list who meets that preference. Um, so that is one, one strategy that we, um, we've discussed with housing agencies through the COP. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so Emily kind of alluded to this, I guess this summer we're gonna see uh, a notice that comes out of the language that was in the HUD budget 
Uh, you know, we are hoping that it will, there will be some flexibilities around the waiting list administration for those of you who uh, manage the EHV vouchers. And I imagine there'll be talk about those over the next two days. Um, there was a lot of flexibility for direct referrals and that uh, really helped that program move quickly. Uh, don't know what HUD is planning, but we're hoping that there will be flexibilities like that and look forward to seeing that notice. Uh, Emily, I'm sure you've been working hard on it. Next slide, please. So that may help provide some, I guess the point of that is that may help some of the waiting list challenges if any of you are still kind of feeling that way, uh, although it was third on the list of your concerns. Uh, so the second on your list of concerns was case management. And um, uh, 62 percent of you, uh, well, let's see, uh, the poll said almost 60 percent of you have partners for application, 77 percent of you have partners for documentation, 62 percent of you have case management, but a little bit less for Lisa, uh, 50 percent. But partnership is is really what makes this program work. Um, you guys, uh, PHAs, some PHAs, uh, you have um you may have service coordinators, um, you may have um, developed a nonprofit, uh, maybe you're moving to work and you are doing some special service related things, but your core activities um, are really uh, around making, administering the housing programs and making them work for people successfully. And that's a big lift. Um, and um, you can't necessarily take on all the things that people need help with in order to use these vouchers. Um, so partners can do all the things on the list that you may need help with. And as I said before, many of you are already doing this, but they can help with outreach and referral, getting documentation, housing search, transportation. Transportation is a, an issue for a lot of people with disabilities. They Many people don't drive, even if they did, they couldn't afford uh, necessarily a car and insurance. Um, and um, uh, so they're uh, relying on public transportation, uh, depending on where you are, if you're in a super rural area or even a suburban area, that's necessar not necessarily going to be um, doable. Uh, uh, some uh, partners have money for move-in costs, security deposit, utility deposits. Uh, if you've been working with the Money Falls a Person program, for example, they have those kinds of resources often. Uh, uh, they also, MFP, but also other pro partners can pay for home access modifications. Somebody who needs grab bars, may needs a little ramp on a step, uh, help with reasonable accommodation requests. These are all things that partners can provide. Next slide. Um, you know, one of the things we heard, um, oh, I want to say one more thing before I, I go back, which is not on the slide, but I was thinking about. Um, I'm not sure if you all are aware, but um, Medicaid, uh, which is a federal program that goes through the states and in some cases through counties, um, uh, pays for lots and lots of the services that are out there these days uh, for individuals um, uh, who are, most of the folks on SSI are gonna be getting Medicaid, for example. And, uh, the federal uh, Centers for Medicaid, Medicaid Services over the last few years has been promote, has changed their rules, uh, pro put out notices kind of like HUD does, their Medicaid director letters. And they now um, are really encouraging states and allowing states to pay for what they call health related social needs. So uh, Medicaid sees that social determinants of health that to keep people out of hospitals, out of nursing facilities, housing really is a really a critical activity. And they have, um, their Medicaid is not allowed by statute to pay for housing, but they are kind of working up to the line. So they are telling states that they can pay for all the one-time costs like security deposits and um, access modifications and application fees. In addition, um, they have approved for at least a couple of states uh, six months of transitional rental assistance while somebody is waiting to get into permanent supportive housing or a voucher or something like that. Um, so those are those that's kind of just emerging at this being paid at the state level to providers. And that is a really interesting opportunity that's out there these days, especially. Um, 
because I do think, as your poll said, uh, or worse, well, uh, a lot of you may have done, um, a lot of you may have had partners when you started this pro project, whether it was in 97 or 18 or just a couple of years ago, but sometimes those partnerships fall off. Um, there are changes in personnel. COVID had a big impact on um, everybody, including social service organizations. And so through the COP, we learned some things about um, success, how to keep successful partnerships going. And none of these are surprises, but it's it's sometimes we need a reminder about that. Uh, who is your key point of contact at your agency, at the partner agency? Uh, do they understand what you can do? and kind of the limits of what you can't do? And do you understand uh, what they can, what they're allowed to do and perhaps what they're not allowed to do? Because uh, there are, they have their own rules and limitations. Um, having regularly scheduled meetings on the calendar, even if you have to uh, cancel them because you don't need them that week. Um, you know, maybe you start out with weekly meetings or bi-weekly meetings. And then um, as things are going well, you meet less often. Can you do a memorandum of understanding or some sort of written agreement that defines the roles and responsibilities um, and update it as needed? So um, uh, doing that can be, uh, you know, setting up a partnership that way. Uh, you know, you may have done again a partnership 10 years ago, but maybe it's time for a refresh or to find a new partner. COVID really um, had a big impact on a lot of nonprofit organizations, and they may not be able to be there right now, or you may want to find a partner who can do something differently. Next slide, please. Um, landlord incentives. So you you are using this. I know HUD's done a lot of um, materials and training on online. Uh, finding in, in incentives for landlords to participate in the program is, uh, for this program and any program is challenging. But um, uh, we found that um, least, uh, both financial and non-financial incentives, such as those here, um, housing agencies found these to help them with utilization. Things like lease signing bonuses, extra security deposits, holding and vacancy fees. Those are things that you um, are allowed to pay for, as we're going to see in a second, using your uh, extraordinary admin fees, if that is something that you put a request in to HUD for, and I hope that you all did. Um, Non-financial incentives are also uh, proved successful with landlords. Um, you know, landlords, uh, if they, you know, your agency, whether it's big or small, if they have a number and a person to call who's responsive, who can help them problem solve, uh, that goes a long way to having, making sure that they are willing to uh, uh, support a tenant through a difficult time, take a new tenant and participate in the program. Uh, making sure your inspection process uh, is as quick as possible, especially if it's a reinspection. Um, and there are some other examples on this slide. I'm sure that I need to keep moving fast. Next slide, please. Um, Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so how to pay for some of these incentives, the ones that are financial. As I said, uh, the notice that uh, came out in 22 allows for security deposits, signing bonuses, vacancy payments, and damage mitigation. I don't know if you all use damage mitigation, but uh, communities in general have found that a kind of a pool of funds promising an owner that if the security deposit doesn't cover damages, that you have some additional funds here that you're willing to pay up to a certain amount to cover additional work um, has proven very successful and oftentimes underutilized. Uh, that just knowing it's there has been an incentive for participation and that, that actually landlords don't draw on it that much. And then outside of your own resources, um, uh, HUD has other kinds of resources that it funds locally, emergency solution grant funds through the COCs or, um, or not through COCs necessarily, but um, homeless programs uh, can pay for some of that for people who are coming from homelessness, home funding, 
CDBG can be used for some of these items. Um, you may have other state or local funding that is not um, HUD money, as well as foundation funding is used for some of this. Next slide, please. Thank you. The last thing I'll talk about is um, I, uh, kind of identifying uh, units uh, that every everybody who gets a voucher, you know, is challenged these days, right? The uh, vacancy rates are low in all your communities. It's hard to find a unit. But for people who are looking for specialized units, it can be a little more complicated. So, for example, you may have people in your program who need accessible units. And we have some suggestions that came up through the COP about how you could do that. Um, my The uh, link here, myhousingsearch.com, which used to be called SocialServe, uh, it's a a portal for rental listings, about 40 states use it. Um, it's a free service. Um, uh, and uh, the reason that it's useful in this context, well, first of all, they do have some market units that are listed and sometimes someone who doesn't need an accessible unit can find a unit there. But um, they, you can do a search specifically for accessible units and you could potentially find something if if you're looking in a state and local community that's listed. So it's a great resource, it's free. Uh, it's not everywhere, but it's a lot of places. Um, some states and communities have developed specific housing search tools for um, accessibility or other things. In Massachusetts, there's one called Housing Navigator. In Minnesota, one called Housing Link. So look around, there might be something there. Um, I wanna, you may already know this, but I wanna remind you all that um, the, all of your states have new units coming on um, uh, under the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Your state housing finance agency is funding the development of projects that come online. And those are almost always, not always, but almost always um, either new construction or substantial rehab, which means that they have to have uh, either fully accessible or visitable units. That's, those, that's kind of... Um, federal requirements that they have to comply with uh, under the Fair Housing Act. Um, so those units um, are units that are, those properties have units that are likely have some accessible units in them. Uh, so having, contacting your state housing finance agency to know when um, tax credit projects are gonna come online in your community can be a helpful way to identify units, both accessible and not accessible that people could be using their vouchers with. If they're not, if those projects aren't reaching out to you, uh, but those are a good resource. And then, um, as we said before, there are partners and agencies who provide funding for home access modifications. That includes money follows a person demonstrations, individuals who are on Medicaid waivers, your local or regional center for independent living all have some um, uh, funding for accessibility. Um, and then the last slide, please. Or let's skip one and go to the next, the last slide, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so um, just two links. One is to HUD's mainstream page, which you know has the NOFA and some really good FAQs. Um, and then HUD Exchange is HUD's um, other website with TA uh, technical assistance, um, things like topic guides, webinars, spotlights, and specifically on the mainstream program, there are some. So check those out. Um, so thank you. I'll hand it back to Julie. Thank you, Lisa. We've got some questions in the chat. Okay, I'll start at the bottom. Uh, the resource again for the available units, I think that was on the prior slide. Yep, myhousingsearch.com. Myhousingsearch.com. And I think even if you if you used to use social serve, I think if you do social serve, thank you, Julie. Juliet's okay. right in there. And, and another question, um, the Medicaid information, like how would a housing authority go about figuring out a contact person through, it sounds like through the state, 
um, to be able to get some of those resources that can help them right up to housing? Yep, it's a good question. Um, every state is structured a little bit differently, and it may actually be, um, you may be able to re, uh, reach them through your county. Um, I will, uh, I need to think about how to how to connect a housing authority specifically to the right state person. Uh, so I will work on that and send you some information before the two days are up. How does that sound? Great. Thank so you. you can post it with the slides. That would be great. And then some examples of some strong service partners, like you, you gave some, but you know, just thinking about how a housing authority would, would go about finding those partners who, who, where should they start? Yeah. Good question. Um, so, uh, I think it, so first of all, I think you, uh, especially if you are newer to your agency, find out if you, um, if you committed to a preference because the service partners may be different depending on what preference you're talking about. So for example, if you committed to serving people experiencing homelessness, going to your uh, continuum of care, which is going to be uh, you know, a regional group of agencies, as you all know, who are working on homelessness is a great place to go. They, they have a coordinated entry list. They, they keep a list of people who are looking uh, they have, you can meet agencies that are supporting people in the community who previously were homeless. That's a great place to go. Um, probably there's there's other agencies if you're looking at preventing homelessness. Some of the agencies that receive the ERAP money in your community during COVID would be a place to look. Um, and you could probably find that list um, at the National Low Income Housing uh, coalition, national uh, nhilc.org uh, will have agencies that ran the prevention programs during COVID. They still keep that. I think it's called the Erase Project. Um, and then we then if you committed to serving people who were coming from institutions, um, examples would be uh, if about 40 states, I think, have a Money Falls the Person program. So I, when I give you the list of contacts, I'll give you a list for that too. They specifically are helping people exit institutions. Your local uh, mental health uh, provider um, could be called, uh, they have lots of different names now. It could be a local mental health entity. It could be a CCBC. Um, I will get you some, I'll get you links for your uh uh, the agencies serving people with serious mental illness, as well as serving people uh, with developmental disabilities like the ARC. And then the Centers for Independent Living um, provide uh, support for people with any disability, but they um, tend to be viewed as serving people with physical disabilities. So I think they're, um, so I will um, get some links and send them over to Julie to put up. Um, after the session. Great, thank you. We know that there's people out there that need our services and it's just a matter of figuring, getting that connection. As yep. um, Dr. Gaither mentioned in her three words, that that connection and, and figuring out who you can partner with to be able to serve them. We're all here to do the same thing, house more families, but sometimes for special, these special purpose vouchers, it can be difficult to, to figure out who to connect to, to um, find those populations. Agreed. Okay. And then some questions that related, I think, Lisa, you spoke to this and also uh, Emily did. Um, so just confirming if they got those mainstream vouchers in 2018, 2019, based on stating that they had a homeless preference, then they have to, so that you kind of spoke to that about required, I, I forget exactly what word you use, but the required preference and knowing that, yes, if you had that, you got the vouchers because you had the preference, you have to keep, you have to continue, but you can limit like you had, you had shared, Lisa. You can do a cap preference. And I don't know what Emily would say, but I, uh, maybe she can come off camera, but um, 
I think it's good to look through those FAQs. There were some about specific, if, as I recall, specifically like if I ran out of homeless um, applicants on my list, what do I do next? I think there were some, the FAQs had some answers to some questions. Yeah, there there are some um, NOFO FAQs on the mainstream page, but I would also look at section 5G of the mainstream policy notice from 2020. I can put that in the chat. It's uh, PIH 2020-01, section 5G, and that is where it states pretty clearly that um, if you did adopt a preference, agree to adopt a preference as one of those, as part of one of those NOFOs, then you should still have be maintaining that preference. And just to, just so I don't forget, I just want to touch on something that Lisa said earlier. That was a great list uh, that she provided of, of potential partners. Um, I would just note that um, if a PHA adopts a preference for uh, applicants referred by a certain agency, and that's their only preference, it can't be disability specific. Uh, people of all with all disabilities need to have access to your mainstream vouchers. So, and if there's any questions, if you have any questions about whether, um, you know, a referral agency is appropriate, I would um, check with FHEO. And then a related question um, about the opportunities to refresh a housing authority's preferences for a, it looks like a specific set of vouchers. Um, over time, the needs of the community can change. And so kind of how they would go about uh, revising or updating their preferences, considering if they got a 2018, 2019 award or, you know, if they didn't get an award that year. If this is something that's a real issue, then um, I, my suggestion would be to email me or the mainstream voucher inbox this question. And it's something I can um, do some research on. As, but Lisa, as Lisa mentioned, you, you can't adopt a limited preference. So um, that is a really good option if you have, if you feel like the preference that you agreed to adopt for the NOFO is no longer serving you or is no longer the best fit. But um, I would say email me this question and we can talk about it more. Hey, great. Thank you. And let's see, there was another comment in the chat about um, our use of acronyms. I know that we we definitely need to spell those out um, more, especially for people that are new to housing. Uh, same with new with new staff at HUD. You know, we we do have a lot of acronyms, so we'll be conscious of that for sure. Um, if there's a specific acronym that you would like us to define, please put it in the chat. Um, any additional questions, please put those in the chat. It looks like I have covered all of them. There was a question about um, sharing the slides and recordings, uh, and that was answered. Yeah, the slides and all recordings will be sent to all uh, registrants after the conference. Okay, so that was the last question I saw in the chat. So we'll open it up and um, have the rest of our panel members, our PHAs, our peers, join us for some discussion. So if we could go to the next slide. So Lisa and Emily are going to stay on. Oh, keep going. Another slide. Uh, well, let me let me stop that. Lisa, was there anything that you wanted to say on that the slide right before this one? Um, just uh, that uh, everybody can, if you're interested in the priced out data for your community, um, it's online uh, for this year and previous years. And uh, so when you get the slides, you'll be able to see the link. Okay, and if we could just go back a slide, just so people can see that one. I'll put the link in the chat. Okay, there we go. So this was the one that you were, that Lisa was speaking about. Okay, so now we'll go into our full panel. So if we could go to the next slide. So again, we have our two speakers with us. Um, Lisa and Emily, and then joining us also are three of your peers from housing authorities. We have um, Andrea McDougall, Executive Director for Mansfield Housing Authority. Um, Andrea, am I pronouncing your name right? I'm sorry. No, that's correct. Okay. Okay. So thank you for joining. 
We have Armika Crawford, Chief Executive Officer at Peoria. Armika, I don't see her on here, but I thought I saw her earlier. I can see you her. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So Armika, okay. if you'd like to say hello. You're muted. Okay. Good morning. Okay, thank you for joining. And Dee Pouliot, Managing Director, Assisted Housing Division in New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here. All right, well, thank you all for joining our panel. So um, we could start off with some uh, questions to prompt discussion, but definitely for anyone to, to ask a question that we can have our panel um, talk through with us. Please put that in the chat. Whether you're a housing authority that is uh, definitely has some potential, some units available, mainstream and NED, and you're just struggling to figure out how to get utilization to increase and utilize those. Um, or if you're a housing authority that is highly utilized, if you like to share your experience also, um, please put some questions, comments in the chat so that we can uh, discuss those. Oh. So for our panelists, so what are the barriers that you have experienced and what have you done to ad address those barriers? What strategies have you put in place that have helped you either to increase utilization or maintain a high utilization for your mainstream and NED? Sure, I'll start. <laughs> um, Yes, maintaining utilization, first getting up to the point where we have a healthy utilization. Um, although our utilization is healthy, it is challenging. And so one of the things that we had to do was partner um, with our local COCC. Um, and in addition to partnering with the local um, COCC, making sure that we have those regular scheduled meetings um, with, the, with the COCC team and, the, um, and our PHA team, um, and, and then making sure that we are um, very intentional about identifying and addressing those barriers where we can. Um, and sometimes we, it may be the application process or co the completion of the application process. So you will have access to um, an applicant, you know, one day and then the next step of the application, the contact numbers change or you can't reach um, the person but yet you're in the middle of this process. So, so how do we change our outreach efforts, which, it, which is what we've done. Um, in addition to that, just making sure, and I think someone mentioned it um, earlier, that everyone understands their role in this um, because it is a, um, it, it, it's a collaboration, but it's a concerted effort to make sure that it, once you identify what the, the roles are, that when we come back to the table in our regularly, regularly scheduled meeting, then we have that report out on each applicant and where we are and what the challenges are. Um, and then in terms of maintaining um, the household once the voucher is leased up, what we've found to be successful, and yet still sometimes we have challenges, is once someone moves into the unit, First, finding the landlord, that's outreach as well. There's a housing shortage everywhere. And so that's also a concerted effort. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we, we aren't. And again, that goes back to that, those regularly scheduled meetings where we're talking about that. So sometimes it's the PHA doing the outreach. Sometimes it's the COCC that takes the charge. And sometimes we're both doing it um, because there's been times where we've had to extend the voucher because we couldn't find housing. But once that, that individual um, is leased up, then that's a relationship that we have not only with the CLCC case manager, with the PHA, um, and with the landlord. We have to bring the landlord into the conversation because in the event that someone should move in, they damage something, these are private landlords, they might want a first inclination is to send them a notice of eviction. But if we have that partnership, we want you to reach out to the caseworker at the COCC. We want you to reach out to the PHA. And in addition, we have, um, which I think is important for us as a best practice that we've engaged with a, um, a local organization that's a landlord tenant, um, that provides landlord ten tenant um, services to our, our, app our 
at those points, those are our participants. And so we may com complete a referral, send it over on behalf of that participant, because at some point, once they sign the lease with the landlord, that's that relationship between the landlord and the participant. We can only go so far. The COCC can only, um, the team of care um, um, can, can only go so far. Um, and so with that landlord um, tenant, um, service provider who we use Prairie State Legal, they've been a, a really good partner in helping our tenants to navigate through some of the challenges that they have. Hopefully I answered the question. Great, thank you. And I can't tell who was speaking. Was that D? I I wasn't speaking, but I, I can. Yeah, that I, can. Add, okay. I can. I can. I can add on to what it, what was said a little bit earlier, a couple of things that in addition to everything that was said, a couple of things we did differently with um, the mainstream vouchers, we received 75 with the CARES Act. And at that point we added, we amended our admin plan and added a new preference. We had the serious risk of institutionalization or transitioning out. We always had those two. And then we added, um, folks who previously experienced homelessness and were in permanent supportive housing or rapid rehousing, kind of that moving on program, and that was an eligible preference. We adopted that for those 75 and leased those up. Not overnight, but we worked with the three COC agencies and they work with their, um, oh gosh, what do they call them? They have um, their agency access points Sorry, I can't think of the name they use. So there were there were a lot of agencies in the in the memorandum of understanding that with the COC agencies and some of these um, folks were in place. They just needed the voucher to kind of move move on and out of the permanent supportive housing program and free up that slot for others. So that ended up being that has been and continues to be a successful. And we just did those seventy five, so we did cap that. Um, at the same time, we've done what, what, what everyone else has been talking about, which we actually um, amended a couple job descriptions to have housing liaisons, mm -hmm. what we used to call an expediter, and they work directly with the landlord community, um, doing all the outreach. We adopted the landlord incentive fees. We used, the, um, we used all of our extraordinary admin fee money, but we're using regular admin fee money, and New Hampshire Housing used some operating funds to also support that. So we do have um, you know, secu limited security deposit assistance, but more the landlord incentive and sign on bonuses. And a lot of outreach into the landlord community, they do presentations. Um, so nothing more to add to what else has been said. So I don't wanna take up too much time saying what things have already been done, but we found that that was helpful. The moving on was very helpful and we are the HFA for the tax credit program, what Lisa was talking about. So our two housing liaisons, they know before the tax credit property is gonna open up, we already know. And, um, you know, referring all voucher holders, they are not just mainstream, but obviously all voucher holders to, to those new properties. We do lots of extensions. Um, it takes time, it takes more than 120 days often to be successful in a lease up. So we do extend vouchers. I I would say our only, um, the only thing we do different with the mainstream than our regular voucher program is because the, the amount is so small, we don't maximize leasing. Like in the voucher program, we might pull three to one for every open slot. And in the mainstream program, we can't over lease. So we tend to pull one for one or one and a half to one. So we can have more holders um, out there at any given time. So our goal is to still increase our utilization rate. You know, we stay around 90%, um, 88 to 90%. Um, but our goal is to obviously increase that. But because it takes so long for each participant to lease up, we're only pulling one to one, we we find that, um, you know, we we have to be careful we have to be careful in our in our issuance of mainstream vouchers where we don't have the same attrition that we can count on in the regular voucher program. So those, I would say, a couple of things that everybody talked about that maybe are different or a little bit different are things we've done. Okay, thank you. 
Andrea, anything you'd like to share? Um, sometimes I, I, I appreciate Dee and everything she does, but it's a totally different world <laughs> than what this housing authority is. We have, we have one person who handles all of our vouchers, all of our programs, and um, the, it, it's a much smaller uh, group of people. There's five people in the office. And, and so we, we became um, creative in how we did things. We worked with the local police station who has what they call a pop division. It's police on patrol. And so they are aware of any crisis that's happening in the community. And so we encouraged, and when we got the vouchers, encouraged them to tell people that they came across within our community to apply and get in. Um, we have a resident service coordinator here who has spent a lot of time working with the paperwork aspect um, of the applicants, which was probably one of the biggest um problems that we came across is is people who uh, were disabled, they don't always have the wherewithal to get through the process. Um, so we all made ourselves available to sit down and go through exactly what they need and, and kind of reassure them that, that this is possible. Um, because the, it sometimes became very quick to throw in the towel. Um, we also had a lot of uh, reaching out to all of our local um, properties and, and landlords to educate them. This isn't the easiest age group, especially as they're younger, um, to get housed. Um, they, they come across a lot of challenges because they don't either have a history or whatever the case is. And and so educating the landlord and, and talking about the process and the, um, the guarantees that we call them for, from the housing authority to be able to provide that kind of reassurance and, and understanding that we're here, we answer our phones. Um, you know, we're, we're here, should they need anything, we're probably our biggest successes to our lease up rate. Great, thank you. Uh, Emily, Lisa, anything additional you'd like to add? I just, I appreciate what Andrew was saying about uh, small housing agencies, you know, stepping up to do this work. It, it's, it, it's a heavy lift. So thank you for doing it. And uh, it sounds like you've been very creative. Definitely. Okay, we got a question in the chat uh, to repeat what we the discussion earlier about adopting limited preferences or or capping those. Um, Emily and Lisa, I think Lisa may have started talking about that. If you could repeat that, and Emily, feel free to jump in. Do you want to do that, Emily, or you want me to? Um, or uh, so. Uh, it's not all or nothing. You don't have to, when you change your tenant selection plan to say, you know, oh, you get five extra points if you're homeless, if you're putting in a homeless preference. You can cap it, meaning you can say, we have a homeless preference for up to 100 vouchers or up to 10 vouchers, or we will serve, uh, uh, you know, 10 people uh, who are living, coming from institutional settings and 10 people who are coming from at risk or experiencing homelessness. So you can cap it because all of, I think we all know there are way more people in every category who have need than you have vouchers. Uh, but it's not, I saw a question in there. It's, it's not a one time deal. So if you in 19 said you were going to serve 50 people who are homeless then you would change your tenant selection plan, go through the required process. You would find and you know issue fifty vouchers until you had you know or issue vouchers until fifty people leased up. And as those vouchers turn over, they don't go back into the general pool. You again continue to secure that fifty voucher number. Emily, did I describe that correctly? 
Yes, yes. And I I put a I put links in the chat to both the mainstream notice from 2020 that talks about limited preferences and also to the topic guide from I think 2022 um that also talks about um how you how you would implement this for mainstream. Hey, another related question is for for people that are new to their PHA and don't have the history back from 2018, 2019 or um, just their preferences in general? How do they find out what preferences were built into their prior applications? So the ones that are 2018, 2019, how do they know um, that they are to required to, to stay, stay by those, uh, keep those preferences in place? Um, if you email me or your your PHA code and what NOFO you think you applied under, that's probably something that's something I can help you with for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat that we haven't answered. So for our panelists, some some other issues. Um we've kind of touched on this, but how to identify applicants that are eligible for your mainstream in NED? Like, for example, um, you have a, maybe you have established a preference um, for applicants or applicants that get referred from a, a partner agency. Like people that maybe are currently on your wait list, how do you identify those that you could pull so you don't miss them and they're 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 down there towards you know mixed in with with people that don't qualify for those preferences maybe we do have that um programmed in our software so when they apply on the application they check off the main you know the three mainstream preference options and we pull when we pull from the waiting list we pull from whether we're pulling neds we also identify neds at the time of application so we're either pulling neds or mainstream on the waiting list today, because we have over 11,000 applicants on the waiting list, about 3,800 have claimed the mainstream preference and 4,000 have qualified for NED based on what they claimed on their application. Sometimes when they reach the top of the application, they're no longer non-elderly. That happens. And then we also, because we do have a memorandum of understanding with the DHHS on the bridge subsidy program, those applicants also qualify for mainstream. So they have their applicants also apply at the same time for mainstream and through another program we have with them. So we we have plenty of applicants to to select from. That's that's not been a problem. The moving on preference, obviously those come directly from that COC with a referral form. And that's capped at through just those 75. So those they're still on the waiting list. They're just, um, we pull from that preference list. That's all kind of program with the software and the application process. Okay. Andrea and Armika, anything you'd like to add for that? Yeah, it's um, pretty much what um, Ms. D has said. It, it's um, a part of our, our program, uh, our software, which allows us to um, give us more ease in identifying those applicants um, um, that we that we need to identify for the mainstream or, or NED program. And Massachusetts has a centralized waiting list, and we're able to set up our preferences and pull lists specific to what we're looking for um, when the list gets pulled. Yes, and then going back to what was stated earlier about um, being able to place caps, although we don't have a, a cap, um, there was a, a, a time when we weren't getting the referrals. When I first started at, at PHA, we weren't getting the referrals and we had a few, uh, we had several openings um, for, the, for both NED and mainstream. And we were able to go back, you know, to the, the MOU and the NOFO and look at that language. And then we were able to identify um, those eligible applicants that were on the wait list that was on, that was on our um, 
on the on the the other wait list and and identify those who were eligible for that preference and we were able to lease up um, because at that time the um, continuum of care didn't have the level of referrals that were needed because they were going through transition as well and one thing that we also have to look at is as we do have turnover and turnover in positions um, and so when that takes place that also presents a challenge um, whether it's with the uh, continuum of care or, or was with or within you know the PHA, but being able to identify um, those applicants who are not coming in through referrals, um, I think that was definitely our saving grace at, at that time. But again, it's, it's within the software. I think too on the on the referral forms that come in, even for for any of the mainstream, because they're all coming in with a preference, we have to verify the preference. And it's usually the agency who verifies if they're at risk or transitioning out. Mm -hmm. And that agency becomes our partner right away. Right. Um, a lot of them, you know, already are, but it's they help with the application, they help with the verification forms. Um, they we contact them, you know, if there are any concerns throughout the process it's not always a perfect world but it's an agency you know that we can um, contact or help and then when we do some of those presentations to the landlord community we are also not often but periodically invited by some of those agencies to do presentations on the process because they get change in staff and they find you know the application process maybe complicated or the verification. And um, so we we do some agency presentations to those um, nonprofit partners. So that tends to help keep um, that flow and connection going when there is a problem. You know, there is a landlord who's upset. Um, only a couple times have we used our admin fees to pay a damage claim. I, I actually twice. Um, and sometimes there are just extenuating circumstances re regarding the situation and we don't want to lose that landlord relationship. So we try to, we also, <laughs> small thing, but we have like Home Depot $50 gift cards that we use periodically with a, either a new landlord coming on, they get their incentive, but they might get a 50, you know, $50 gift card just as a, sorry, this happened. And, um, you know, we, we, we don't want to lose that relationship as well. So we've tried to do a couple of different things to keep the landlord community. We, Like I said, we have 4,000 applicants. We have plenty of applicants, but without the landlords, we, we can't be successful. Absolutely. And we've kind of touched on some of these um, questions also. So common challenges that are experienced by your household at that uh, initial outreach application stage, like, and, and what you've done to help them along. Like we've talked about um, some housing navigators um, to help them through the process, more hand-holding maybe to get through, gather documentation. Um, so anything you would like to add about some of those it, challenges? and what you've done to help them at that application stage. So one of the things that, we, that we've been doing, and I touched on this earlier, I would say um, that, that partnership, as Dee has said, with the continuum of care and some of the other service providers, they're critical. Um, in many instances, they have more access um, because they're doing, uh, they're providing other services to the applicants, so they'll have more access to those applicants than than we might have. And so, once we make that initial contact, um, what we have done is um, have um, a consent forms um, between the PHA, the applicant, and the continuum of care, which then will allow us to then work directly with that continuum of care to get the information that we need to data sharing. Um, because that's some of the some sometimes the challenges. So we have you know a data sharing agreement. We have the consent that allow us to um, to speak to the the caseworker on the continuum with the continuum of care on behalf of that um, um, applicant, um, and then some advocacy on both sides of um, the the partnership, um, especially with the PHA. 
with that first time lease up, not only are we just, you know, leasing specialists or leasing consultants, we are case, we, we are case managers. We must advocate as well. Um, sometimes it's advocating with the landlord where they intend to, to move. Um, and then also dispelling the myths about vouchers and, I mean, we all know that it's out there. We, I lease to someone with the voucher, they're going to tear my unit up, but that's not always the case. So we also hold the, um, and this goes directly back to the application and completing the application, those landlord forums that we have. Um, so why should you participate in, in the program and what assistance might some of these applicants you know, need? So we, I think including the landlords and a part of that conversation up front um, or even, even um, bringing landlords on board um, to accept vouchers so that we can have more um, um, availability for our applicants. And that I think that makes the the roles of the caseworker for the PHA and the continuum of care just slightly, um, a little bit, uh, slightly um, less challenging because we are informing um, landlords. And then also with the applicant, then my last point, and I'll be quiet and let everyone else speak, and we still have this challenge is um, we are we have one inspector because the other inspect you know, that this is a vacant um, position. So how does this one inspector um, address the housing choice vouchers and then all the special vouchers at the time of lease up? Because the, the unit needs to be inspected. So how do we prioritize? And so we have preferences in terms of how people are selected from the wait list. Do, does this then transition over to how we conduct inspections? And so, or move inspections always first, second, you know, um, first and then annual second. So we're working through that challenge now that we have this, this vacancy, but that's always um, what we find recently that that has been a challenge to move in. We get through the application that we're waiting on an inspection. And so we're we're constantly looking at ways to improve the process. Although you may have best practices, those best practices sometimes, you know, you retain them because they work. And then sometimes you have to adjust based on how the, the market is changing or um, your staffing or what's going on with your partners. Yeah, for Mansfield, we we don't even have case management, so there is no continuum of care. There are no partnering agencies. There are people that we have built relationships with throughout our region, um, and we we spend a lot of time setting up the expectations of what what we need from the applicant. Um, we usually do it kind of in piecemeal with several visits into the office so that we can to mark off our checklist to say we, we're missing this. We need this documentation. We need this completed, um, whatever that process is. And uh, as the voucher is being issued, in the meantime, we're also running in the background, checking with landlords to find out availability and um, and sending them into a, a different direction. I mean, we do, it's basically a matter of sitting down and, and setting expectations and then um, following back through to make sure that those dates and those deadlines are met and that those the obligation of the applicant is fulfilling their goal of getting housed. And I, I think from the landlord's perspective, they don't know they 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 have a disability. They don't know really anything about this client. So we hear that for some landlords, you know, we have one landlord in New Hampshire says like, no more VASH, I'm not taking any more VASH. And it's like, don't tell them you're VASH. Like, you don't, how do they know? Like the same with someone with a disability or it's just, you know, helping them get the paperwork and all that and get the apartment. But the landlord, they they wouldn't know. They don't know. It's a mainstream voucher, a VASH, a FOP. You know, they they don't know, necessarily need to know. There's no one telling them. We're not telling them. But I mean, if there is case management, I know that sometimes the landlords like that too, because we also have some 811 units in our, you know, in our, in our multifamily side. So landlords like knowing that there is some an agency to call, which is fine if that's what the client wants to share with them. But it's not necessarily coming from us um, you know that they're working with 
Manchester Mental Health. You know, when I mm -hmm. we wouldn't we wouldn't be sharing that kind of information, and and in most cases there there are very few um, terminations of rental assistance for noncompliance for that. So, you know, we I think it's a little bit invisible sometimes to the community of of of, of who who is the voucher holder. Because, like you said, there there are myths out there that you know they're they're all bad or they're all on welfare or what, whatever whatever the community or landlords may think, and we want to dispel those myths and and you know try to build up on that customer service and other in that relationship. Yeah, Dee, I love the way you talk about that uh, about the stigma, both uh, people who are poor in general, people with disabilities, vouchers, the kind of whole universe you guys have to work with. I will say that uh, I'm sure that you get applicants who uh, landlords are going to screen out because until uh, someone says, oh, I have a disability and I'm, I want a reasonable accommodation, right? Like I, you know, I, I had a rough time, I got evicted, uh, but I've cleaned up my act, I'm, you know, taking meds or I'm going to a program. And, uh, and so at that point, someone would have to, um, disclose essentially if they wanted that unit badly enough that would be up to the individual um and um and and i agree i think a lot of times landlords uh it's a it's a double edged sword but they do like to know somebody's got case management they like to know there's somebody i can call uh i was wondering if everybody routinely asks um applicants for like um a contact person uh you know if if there's an issue. Do you guys usually do that? Yes. Okay, well, to our participants, if there are any barriers that we haven't talked about, feel free to put those in the chat, uh, what you're experiencing, um, any tips, anything that hasn't been shared so far of what has worked for you or is working for you, uh, feel free to put that in the chat to share with everyone. Kind of on the landlord issue, um, is there anything special that you do in your recruitment so that you, you are making PHA is aware of the different populations that you serve, um, that you may have VASH vouchers or foster to, to youth vouchers for youth aging out of foster care, um, and of course, Mainstream and NED, just to try to have them have an awareness of the different populations we serve and maybe some of their challenges um, that a, a landlord may see in their screening, just trying to prevent some of that um, rejection through the screening process and build on our common goal to house more families and especially those that are in our very vulnerable populations. I'll go again. <laughs> so um, I'm from Illinois, we're in Illinois and one of the challenges that we have, and the reason I mentioned we're in Illinois um, is because we also have um, a source of income um, law uh, on the books, mm. um, which we have taken an active role as a PHA in hosting and having conversations with stakeholders regarding um, that source of income law and how it impacts housing, whether it's vouchers or, or public housing. Um, um, and it, and we also have, uh, you know, of course, the 180 day look back period, um, you know, for, for, for background screening. Um, and that's, um, and we apply that to both our public housing and, and for our vouchers, even though landlords may do something different. And I bring that up because as we have our landlord forums and as we have conversations with landlords, that gives us an opportunity to talk about um, the different special purpose vouchers. And we use the, the um, special purpose vouchers fact sheet that's on HUD's website to help explain that. Um, and then we also 
talk about, you know, the source of income. And I think it was Emily or someone else talked about, I think the $900 or just over $900 average monthly income for those with social security. And what, what we find, what we have seen here is the landlord saying, well, how can you possibly afford to live here if this is what the money that you receive monthly, but they're, they were not taken in consideration with the voucher would cover. Um, and so what we, we find ourselves doing, and it's still a challenge, is uh, again, going back to dispelling that myth about um, vouchers, but also broadening the understanding of all the type of vouchers that are out there, the benefits of accepting vouchers, how it not only helps the community because you know you're we're 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 housing providing housing for everyone, just not just that population that we deem good tenants, if you will. Um, everyone has the potential of being a good tenant, and everyone deserves to be housed. And uh, so, what we are trying to do is make sure we're striking up conversations and keeping that conversation going, um, because as long as I've been in housing, there's there's been this challenge. And so since we know that this is always a challenge, it's good to continue that conversation. And that's what we have been doing, just continuing the conversation and providing the facts and then being able to have some landlords at those forums or we partner with the local uh, association of realtors here. And so they're also a champion as well. So we quarterly, we, um, um, we do presentations at their local chapter um, and we talk to, to private landlords about the voucher program and the various type of vouchers. And as um, Andrea was saying, which I think she's awesome because she doesn't have the, the same resources and what she's doing is getting out and, and talking to those partners. I think that's that, that helps. It, it won't resolve everything, but that has been um, one of our best practices. Well, thank you. And we're coming to a close for our session. And I appreciate all of the information from our speakers, from our PHA panelists, from the participants that have put comments in the chat. Uh, there have been a few additional comments with some good tips that we can all use to help increase utilization of mainstream and NED to house more families. That's ultimately our common goal. Um, it looks like we are going to take a 15 minute break before the next session. Um, if you have additional questions, you can email them to spvconference at enterprisecommunity.org. It's there on the lower left-hand side of the screen. And uh, again, you will get the slides and a, a link to the, the recording of the, the presentation too. So thank you again for the work that you do to help mainstream and Ned families and in your general voucher uh, work every day. Really appreciate you. So thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.